The turn of the millennium was a pivotal moment for the mining industry. Lots of research on the resource curse, the development of the MMSD, the establishment of the ICMM, and it was largely led by the mining industry. We talked to John Samuel of Anglo-American, one of the main companies behind that development. John, welcome to Raw Talks. Thank you very much. Fifteen years later, has the industry's awakening to socioeconomic concerns translated into better results on the ground amongst the communities? I think so, particularly for the larger companies, uh, you know, and those that have um, an intelligent uh, understanding of their long-term self-interest, who have company values that are committed to, um, you know, treating people fairly and obeying laws and those sorts of things. We could look back at what we were doing 10, 15 years ago and understand that actually it wasn't that great uh, and, and we have come a long way. I think more broadly some of the regulation the sector and business more broadly faces now has been quite helpful in pushing some of those uh, sort of developments forward. So things like uh, legislation on revenue transparency or labour rights or uh, indeed on things like corruption, which is significantly tightened over the last 10 to 15 years. Again, I think that's been helpful and positive about getting better impacts uh, in host communities. Uh, I do worry, though, that for those companies that are not so concerned about their reputation or flying below the radar, maybe the changes are much more negligible. Maybe we're not seeing a lot of change, uh, and those companies actually account for the vast majority of mines worldwide. So the view of an external stakeholder looking, on, stakeholder looking in on the industry might feel that not enough has changed and they're, they're probably fair in that assessment. And when you're talking about progress, what is it you measure? Are you looking at happier communities, wealthier communities? What would be your definition of improvement? We're developing a non-renewable natural resource. For many communities, that will represent a one-off chance for them to get a significant uplift in their socioeconomic development. So I think that's the frame that we in the industry should be looking at that challenge through. Can we turn that mineral endowment into a sustainable uplift to host communities and that might be a more diverse economy, it might be better infrastructure, better educated people. I think it will depend on the context and I think we, one of the things we have learned in the last 10 to 15 years is that we actually don't know what's good for our host communities, they know what's good for them and it's incumbent upon us to, to get better at asking. So I think you know, the measures we'd be looking at would be yeah, uplift on things like the sustainable development goals, uh, but also our communities feeling that we're better neighbours than we were 10 to 15 years ago, perhaps. Your shareholders, they expect higher returns on their investments and your communities expect more benefits from their resources. How do you resolve this tension? The best contribution we can make is really to help uplift the productivity of both the local private sector and the local social sector in some senses too. And the best levers we have for doing that are actually through the value chains and the expertise that we have within the business. So, you know, half our turnover in Anglo-American typically goes out through the door in procurement, for example. So local procurement and enterprise development are a massive lever for us. We spend 100 times more on procurement than we do on social investment, for example. And through focused local procurement programs, we're putting hundreds of millions of dollars more into 20 to 30 host communities now than we were 10 years ago, for example. Um, local workforce development is really important. That's our second biggest chunk of our turnover and our cost base. But that doesn't talk to the shareholders, that talks more to the communities. So I think uh, the shareholders have a right to a return and I think part of that involves um, you know, using our development interventions in the most cost-effective manner and doing it in such a way that we can go about our business as they hope we can, so without delays, without interruptions, etc. Uh, and so I think these levers are, are the main ones we can use. So, yeah, firstly, local procurement and enterprise development, local workforce development, you know, which is an increasing challenge because the industry is increasingly a skilled industry. It's not the mass labour industry that it once was. Uh, and then we look at things like building the capacity of host governments. You know, our third biggest cost item usually is the taxes we pay. So again, trying to make sure that those taxes are well used. And if they're well used, then uh, actually you can do an enormous amount of good. If they're not well used, actually people tend to come back for more tax rather than look at government perhaps. So, so those are the levers. And we still see a role for social investment. Uh, we just think it should be focused on those things where our value chains can't really have much of an impact. You know, so an example would be things like education or um, particularly early years education or healthcare projects, for example. Let's move on into the current trends in the industry. In the past, mining was assumed to deliver local benefits um, through direct jobs and business opportunities like uh, the local supply chain. But there's some structural changes that actually are shrinking that pool and automation, 
global procurement are two cases in point. How are these trends affecting your communities on the ground? You're right, there's been a bit of a shift in what we can offer host communities, particularly as industries, the industries become higher skill. But I don't think we can fight that. So productivity, you know, is the essence of any successful business. The industry actually doesn't have a great track record on productivity over the years. So we're playing catch up with many other industrial sectors. You know, so we're putting a lot of money into our innovation program, which we call Future Smart Mining, which, you know, will have labor productivity effects. And, you know, there are different ways you can deal with that. You can either produce more because with the same number of workers or you can you can reduce headcount, and in all honesty, we'll be doing a bit of both uh, in our operations as we deploy these productivity technologies. Um, but I think also without employing these productivity technologies, many of the operations we're looking at today probably wouldn't be viable as well. So it's hard to kind of get a, an overall effect or a picture at any single operation, but we know that long run, if the industry doesn't improve its productivity, um, and if the company doesn't improve its productivity, then we don't have much of a future. On the the global procurement piece, I think, you know, again, that's a potential risk, but I think our experience is that as we've brought the best of our expertise to bear through a more centralised approach to procurement, for example, we've actually been able to transfer our best practices in local procurement. So we're actually procuring a lot more today from host communities than we were 10 years ago. Um, you know, and it is hundreds of millions of dollars more, and that's through the spreading of best practice. And we've found that the really good local procurement programs actually end up saving us money by having more competitive and resilient local supply chains. They don't save us huge amounts of money, it's not transformative, but they more than pay for themselves. But is it the business case that led to the programs or did you discover that along the way? We felt it was an imperative to increase local sourcing because it was something that a lot of our host communities were uh, asking for. And, but also logically, again, if you look at the turnover of a mining company, about half the turnover is comprised of, of uh, procurement. So it's a logical lever to try and pull. There was a time when no one expected the industry to play a role when it comes to broader economic development, but today there is increasing pressure for the, for the industry to take a leading role, for example, when it comes to the sustainable development goals. But to what extent should companies get involved in this broader economic development? And we're talking now beyond jobs and beyond local supply chains. I think the mining industry is unusual in the extent to which people have expectations of it to catalyze socioeconomic development in host communities and host countries. But, you know, so, but that is because we are developing these non-renewable natural resources. So I think there is a sort of an implicit deal there between, between uh, companies and, and host governments and, and communities. Uh, and so we should work with that rather than fight it. I think there are some reasons why we would want to be engaged. Firstly, uh, stable, prosperous communities are much easier places to operate businesses than, than poor, fractious ones, for example. It's easier to attract talent, it's easier to recruit locally, it's easier to procure locally, for example, if you're in a relatively prosperous, stable place. So we have a vested interest and we're very long-term investors, so we can take more time perhaps than, than most other development actors on a, on a long-term approach to socioeconomic development. Ultimately, you know, governments are increasingly looking for good partners for uh, the development of their mineral resources um, and so again the companies that can show that they've got an intelligent approach that they're committed to supporting socio-economic development I think over the long run will get a better opportunity to develop some of the more attractive ore bodies in the future so it's in our long-term interest as well I think to be responding to these things and I you know they take a lot of time and attention they don't often take huge amounts of money relative to some of the other um, you know, spending items we have in our business. So I think it's, it's well worth us applying our minds to how we can do that better. But what does it mean in practical terms? How do you work with health and the broader social impact? The best contribution we can often make beyond our own value chains is actually building capacity. So, you know, everything you need to run a town, you need to run a mine. You need doctors, IT, human resources, consultation, infrastructure, you name it. So we have a lot of expertise um, that we can bring to bear uh, and we also can partner with other organisations. You know, the SDGs, one of the great advantages of them is that they're a shared endeavour. Um, and so we're certainly interested in working out how we can play a bigger role in working with partners. It shouldn't be something we do on our own, it has to be done with partners to actually build capacity, whether that's the capacity of local government to deliver education or power or water, or the capacity of the local health system to provide appropriate care. We do that for our employees. We have that expertise. We can share some of that in the places where we're operating. And of course, typically, you know, we're in quite remote places. Normally the organizations that have that level of expertise are sitting in big cities and they have to deploy people out to those communities. We're there already. We're not there in many of those communities in the great scheme of things, but in the ones we are.
present in. We have an opportunity to, to share a lot. And are you working with government on yes. those type of projects? I think if we looked back 10, 15 years ago, we would think our intervention in health or education would be building a school or building a clinic and then handing it over. I think we know that doesn't really work. If there was going to be at a fully effective school or clinic there before we arrived, it would be there already. So, And the reasons for that are often not to do with a lack of funding. Actually, quite often, even in developing countries, the funding is there. It's the capacity to, to develop and to manage those facilities. So I think as mining companies, we probably have collectively funded a fair few relatively small white elephants dotted around host communities and I think we've all come to a realisation now that if it's not done with government, with communities, in response to their aspirations, not our best ideas uh, about what they need, um, if we don't do it that way then we almost certainly won't be successful. Let's address SEAT, Anglo-America's well-known toolkit uh, for measuring and managing social impact. In a recent World Talks with Professor Glyn Cochran, he raised a concern about the proliferation of manuals and toolkits and noting the risk of becoming too prescriptive. Has the industry become too prescriptive? I essentially agree with what uh, Professor Cochrane was saying uh, and one of the things we've learnt over the last 10 years or so was that actually the people who are successful at managing social performance tend to be people who have expertise in various aspects of the social sciences or a lot of their own personal expertise where they've, they've come through other disciplines within the company, um, you know, whether it's exploration or mining. But People have developed a, a strong core of expertise over their career and the people that have come to the discipline from other disciplines have also taken time to learn some of the aspects of social sciences. So I think he's, I think he's right. You can't just give people toolkits and expect them to go away and be able to manage you know, it's often quite complex, wicked problems um, first time around. So I think that is right and social performance as a professional discipline is a relatively recent concept but I think it's one that's actually increasingly accepted across the mining industry uh, and certainly in Anglo-American. So, so, so I agree with him. I do think guidelines and, and best practice can be uh, very useful though. Uh, you know, as a business we're running about 35 to 40 operations. Um, it's really helpful to be able to collate and share and disseminate best practices. Um, it's also the case that some of the external commitments we take on uh, formally or implicitly actually require us to follow some quite specific procedures. So. You know, an example would be a complaints and grievance procedure. You know, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights do actually mandate some quite key requirements of a complaints and grievance procedure. And I think it would be unwise to expect every operation to come up with their own procedure, go off, find the best practice from the UN, find the guidance that's been produced by various entities, whether they be industry bodies or academics, and then produce that and put that into their own unique site level process. I think it makes much more sense for us as a business to capture those sorts of requirements and build them into standard processes. But you can't give a novice a standard process. Um, you know, they're like a machine. People need to be trained. They need to have the right level of education to use them, etc. You can't get away from needing the right expertise, but I think there is a, a, a case for good standardised guidance on those topics that are amenable to that. You cannot manage what you cannot measure, uh, ties in what you we were saying, and measuring and reporting surely is one of the big success stories we've seen in the industry over the past, say, 15 years. But there is a risk that reporting becomes an end in itself rather than a tool to inform policy. Has reporting become a media exercise? And this is also something that Professor Cochran talked about. I'm not actually sure it's true that you can't manage what you can't measure, to be honest. Um, I think any parent would tell you that they have a lot of management of their children without measuring them that much. But I think it's helpful if you can measure, because it, it, it's easier to communicate information if people are responding to, to well understood indicators. So I think, you know, it's right that we've focused on that. I think a lot of progress has been made, and I think as an industry we've been able to build a lot of confidence, for example, on things like revenue transparency by being very transparent and reporting the payments we make. You know, the leading mining companies, the leading oil and gas companies, we all understand that that's actually fundamentally in our interests. Uh, and I think we've greatly benefited from, firstly, proactively um, putting uh, that sort of information out there in the public domain, and we've been doing it for, for more than a decade in Anglo-American. But then also the regulation that's been formed by industry good practice, I think, has also been, been helpful. So the EU Transparency Directive, I think, actually is a, a positive thing for the extractive sector. I do sometimes worry, though, that um, we're not measuring all of the things that are always important. Um, you know, so there are some things that are important that are, I think, quite well measured now. So transparency, carbon, water, etc. There are lots of things that are well measured. 
things like biodiversity impacts and things like community acceptance, I think, are actually not very well measured yet. Let's consider your relationship with government and communities. What are the strategic priorities for the industry moving forward? I think we need to continue to improve uh, and continue to learn how to do that. One of the things we've been working on in the last two or three years, uh, along with partners at Kellogg Innovation Network at Northwestern University, is something called the Development Partner Framework, and that calls for looking at the mine in a regional setting. Uh, and our platinum business in South Africa piloted that in Limpopo province. So, and what they found was by putting in a bit of upfront money into developing really good regional spatial plans to identify opportunities, we actually found a much broader range of opportunities than we could possibly have found if we only looked in the environment of our operations if, you know, in our host communities. And having done that work, we came up with about 25 different high potential development interventions. And having shared that with stakeholders, including government, multilateral donors, uh, NGOs, but also other companies, including other mining companies, there's actually a lot of shared interest in developing a common delivery platform that can take each one of those high priority interventions, make sure it's got a sponsor and develop them in an integrated way that, uh, that we couldn't possibly do as single companies. And uh, you know, by way of example, there's a lot of potential for certain agricultural crops, but we really need to invest at scale to do that with big feed put into, um, into central processing facilities. Uh, no one company can support that, but if we act in concert, we can have scale at that sort of impact. So I think that regional lens on development opportunities is, is where we need to focus next. Thank you very much for joining Raw Talks, John. Thank you. And to keep up with the new debate on extractives and development, join us at wartalks.org.